Also, I'm going to take more advantage than the other moderators have done of having been given a microphone to say a couple of things to set up the panel. Listening this morning to Susan and to Hank reminds us that neuroscience is a very large topic. Law is a very large topic. These are very large bodies of information and disciplines, and they intersect at various places. As Willie said at the very beginning, the legal academy, especially the elite legal academy, thinks about limited numbers of issues and gets excited by limited numbers of things. The popular press gets excited by a limited number of things. To some extent, a certain amount of scientific over-enthusiasm, not so much from the neuroscientists, but from others who think, aha, now we're going to get science to control the unruly processes of the law, sometimes get excited about particular things. So my perspective on this panel is this is one of the things that people have gotten very excited about, and I think it's one of the less exciting aspects of the intersection of law and neuroscience. It seems to me, from the things we've heard already, it's likely that there will be a vast interface between law and neuroscience. It will be much, there will be much more of it. It will be more pervasive, and it will be much more ordinary than some of the issues that have excited the most intellectual discussion. A second thing that we might gather from some of what Hank especially was saying is the relationship between science and law is often, often seems to be that science is going to come in and fix things. And once the thing gets going, it turns out to be that law starts to get interested in controlling the science. Law is how we resolve disputes. We allocate resources. We work out conflict. And it's not just law like lawyers and professionals and judges. A lot of law is just what the democracy gives us to work with. And that's the way it's going to be, and that's the way it has to be. So some of the interface between law and neuroscience is going to be about things like what legal controls will there be on some kinds of new technology. And that's another issue. But what we're going to have on this panel is one of the hot button issues, responsibility and criminal law. You've already heard from Susan some interesting information about what might actually be going on in the courts that looks a little different than what some of the academic debate has been about. There are three maybe sorts of topics that we might hear about in this. One is responsibility. That's the free will thing. Law and criminal law grew up in an era when there was a certain model of how people behaved. On the other hand, it's not that law requires, criminal law requires some assumption of free will, as you've also heard. Determinism has been around for a very long time. We have known, educated folks, science educated folk have come to believe, to think we know, that people's behavior is the product of forces that operate on them, genetic, environmental, whatever. We've known that for a very long time. And one question is whether neuroscience, which might provide better information about the mechanisms by which that happens, says anything different to the law than any of the other theories that have been in existence for the last 150 years about how people come to behave the way they do. The science may be better, but law resisted biological, genetic, sociological, psychoanalytic, phrenological theories of how people's behavior operates, not because it was bad science. The lawyers didn't know that at the time. Most lawyers assumed it was all good science. Whatever they were getting from the scientists, they rejected it anyway. Will this be different? Second, what the law does use are concepts that in the neuroscience community I've often heard denigrated as folk psychology. But these are terms that we all use in our everyday life. The law asks, what did somebody know? Did that person act with a purpose? Did that person consciously avoid a risk? Was he aware of the risk? Things of this sort. What insight does neuroscience give us into whether those concepts are usable and how we can find out whether people knew or were aware and so on? 
Uh, and finally, there's the prediction and treatment set of issues that surround uh, sentencing. How will we treat people uh, when it's decided, for whatever reason, that society should intervene uh, and, and, and treat them in some way different than they treat other citizens, whether we call it uh, a criminal uh, punishment, whether we call it uh, psychiatric commitment or something else. Uh, what are we going to do with these people for how long and what, uh, with what techniques, uh, with what, what methodologies? Uh, so these are all the questions uh, that the criminal law may ask. Uh, I suspect uh, that uh, the most interesting answers from neuroscience are, and to the lawyers are going to be in the second two categories, uh, but uh, the big public debate is often about the first. So we're going to hear from uh, uh, one lawyer uh, and three uh, uh, scientists, although the lawyer is one of the more scientifically trained, most scientifically trained uh, law professors that we've got. Uh, and I'm going to follow the tradition at my home law school, which is that the introducer says, and now here's someone who needs no introduction and therefore will receive none. Uh, you've got it in your book, uh, Stephen Morse. <laughs> Thanks very much, Jerry, and thank all of you and uh, National Academy and the Royal Society. This is a man I have called in my writings, Mr. Oft. Oft stands for orbital frontal tumor. You will remember, if you were awake during Hank's talk, which I know you all were, he talked about a guy who had a right orbital frontal tumor who became a pedophile and seemingly causally as a result of the orbital frontal tumor. I recently did a presentation on this guy with the uh, chair of our neurology department at Penn who had never, never seen this article before. And the first thing he saw, and the first time he saw this slide was when we were doing the presentation together. He looked, he points at, that's not supposed to be there, <laughs> right? Well, I'm going to darken it just to keep you awake. Here's what I'm going to do. I was given the task in 15 minutes, and I am going to be breathtakingly superficial, even for me, of giving you a framework for thinking about responsibility and sentencing issues that I think is the best goodness of fit model there is for the law as we have it today, and some considerations you should be thinking about in applying that model to questions of responsibility and sentencing. I'll then suggest some ways in which neuroscience can help us perhaps refine the categories. I will suggest why we should reject any radical change in our responsibility practices, although certainly reform is potentially possible. And then I'm going to return to an actual application. I'm going to go through Mr. Roft and tell you how the analysis would look with the hardest possible case in the sense of the one that looks the most neurologically devastating, where all you want to do is think mechanistically and you want to drop the law's typical framework. Okay. The law of psychology and your psychology, as Jerry Lynch just alluded to, are precisely the same. It's folk psychology. Now, there's an enormous amount of dispute in the philosophy of mind and in psychology about what exactly folk psychology is, but roughly it's a partial explanation of human behavior using mental states such as knowledge, desires, beliefs, intentions, willings, plans. We can argue about the furniture, but that is the psychology. Even when I talk to neuroscientists, I say something like, why are you in this room today? No one tells me a story about their brain and nervous system. They tell me a story about their reasons for being here, and that's folk psychology. And the law is folk psychological. Think what law is. It is a series of rules or standards that are meant to help guide us in our behavior. It gives us reasons for action or reasons for forbearance. And the only kinds of creatures that can use rules and standards, much like morality, much like etiquette, much like social norms generally, are creatures that can be guided by reason. And that's what the law presupposes. All right, now, what's the law's concept of responsibility in criminal law? Basically, there are four criteria, and now I'm being really abstract again, but first, you have to engage in some kind of intentional action, such as a knifing or a shooting. Then you have to have a mental state, a further mental state with which you are performing the action. It's my purpose to kill, or no, I know I'm just creating a great deal of risk that someone might get killed by my behavior. That's called the prima facie case. You do that, there's a violation. Then there are some excusing conditions lack of rationality, and lack of control capacity. And that is about it. And notice it's all about mental states. It's all about conduct. Right? Now, what are distractions? As far as I'm concerned, if we never talked about free will again in the criminal justice system, we would be doing ourselves a very great favor. When most people use free will, they're waving their hand at a conclusion they want to reach about how this case ought to come out. You want the guy to be responsible? 
He had free will. You don't want the guy to be responsible. He didn't have it. Free will is not part of any legal criterion. And all I can do is give you conclusions. Each, each thing I'm saying, I could give you a one-hour lecture easy. It isn't even foundational for criminal responsibility. Even if determinism is true, some people act, some people are sleepwalkers. Some people have the mental state required by the definition of the crime, some people don't. Some people are legally insane, some people are not. And the distinctions the law draws within folk psychology for responsibility are distinctions we have good moral, normative, and legal reason to endorse. Reasons having to do with what people deserve, and reasons having to do with social safety and other kinds of consequential concerns. So we should stop talking about free will. Causation, per se, is not an excusing condition. Just the fact that you can give a causal explanation for why something happened does not mean the person is not responsible. You've got to show that a genuine excusing condition, such as I wasn't rational at the time and it wasn't my fault, or I was acting under duress, or I lacked control capacity, or one of the standard excusing conditions must be present. Now, here's the problem for neuroscience and law. Law is all about acting agents, about agency and action language. Neuroscience is all about mechanism. Neurons don't have reasons. Neurons are just electrophysiological switches. That's all they are. So how do you move from the mechanistic language of neuroscience to the action language of law? That's the translation problem. And it's a particularly difficult one compared to its nearest analog, psychiatry and psychology. And the comparison is interesting. Because <clears throat> uh, Judge Fletcher brought that up earlier. Notice that psychology and psychiatry sometimes are mechanistic. But more often than not, they talk about acting human beings. And so therefore, the translation is going to be somewhat easier, especially when psychology and psychiatry are talking action language and are not talking about mechanism. All right, the question then always is, OK, we've got a bit of neuro data. How precisely does it answer the legal question we have? That's the question that the advocate for the evidence always has to answer. I've got a question about law. I've got a legal issue to resolve. How does this evidence precisely, don't wave your hand, tell me how precisely it helps me answer that question. Show me, maybe you can show it to me directly, maybe it's indirect, but then you have to show me the chain of inferences that gets there from here. And what you've heard a lot about today, and you hear it especially in death penalty cases, is what I call the difference between real and rhetorical relevance. When we're talking about things like guilt and innocence at the trial, then relevance has really got to be shown. Now, I'm not saying judges are always getting it right, but the question is very specific. When it comes to the death penalty, as Judge Fletcher and others have told you, the kitchen sink comes in, and no one really worries about relevance anymore. It's rhetorical. Show that somebody's got a hole in their head, my God, we shouldn't potentially punish that person at all, even though that hole in the head may bear no relationship to any excusing or mitigating condition we know about in the person. Okay. Given what we know today about neuroscience, what my talk is is a plea for what I call neuromodesty rather than neuroarrogance. Many people in this room are extremely sophisticated about neuroscience, and what we know is we have no idea how the brain enables the mind. We have no idea about the brain-mind action connection. We know tons of stuff. We've made astonishing advances, but at the most basic level, we don't know the most basic things. And many people think that these are the hardest questions in science, and it's no surprise that we don't know them yet. Neuroscience, in its modern guise, is an infant science. Right? So fMRI came online less than two decades ago, and it's working on the hardest problems there are. Is it any surprise we don't understand the most basic questions? It isn't. A lot of what we know is correlational. Virtually none of what we know is causal. Much of it is coarse-grained as opposed to fine-grained. There are all sorts of problems, and I'm not taking a thing away from neuroscience. I'm just trying to say, if we are going to use it for law, We've got to be precise, we've got to be careful, and we've got to keep our concepts straight. Another point, actions speak louder than images. And you saw this in one of uh, Susan Wolf's cases that she brought up today, where a judge said, this guy is competent, his behavior is entirely competent. I don't care what his brain looks like. And that's right. 
because the legal criteria are action, folk psychological criteria, and in that case, with rare exceptions, there can be cases of malingering, actions speak louder than images. In fact, if someone were to tell you, when you see a, a defendant behaving in a certain way, that he couldn't possibly be behaving in that way because this is the way his brain looks, what you know is, for that question, the brain science is invalid because it shouldn't be telling you he can't be acting that way. He's acting that way. Actions speak louder than images. So let me go through very briefly sort of five doctrinal areas in which one might think neuroscience is relevant today. And what I want to suggest in every case is we're not there yet. First, on the act doctrine. Did the person intentionally act? There's almost nothing the neuroscience can tell us, especially since we're doing a retrospective evaluation. Conceivably, somebody has a neurological disorder that makes it more likely that they were acting in some kind of dissociative state. That is certainly a possibility. I don't rule that out, but very few cases. Did the person have the mental state required by the definition of the crime? We don't have a clue yet, neurologically, how to get those markers. In fact, Reed Montague and I are working on a study to try to get at that, as are some other people. Legal insanity. It may surprise many of you that as the American Psychiatric Association is about to publish DSM-5, they were hoping they would have neuromarkers for the most severe mental disorders. There is not yet one mental disorder sufficiently well validated for neuromarkers that you can use them diagnostically. This is not to say there aren't differences between people with and without disorder. It's just there's so much overlap between the curves that they're not sufficiently specific and sensitive enough. How about sentencing? Culpability. Can we use neuroscience for diminished rationality, diminished uh, control capacity? Not yet, and not nearly as good as behavior. How about prediction questions? Future dangerousness, drug relapse, and the like. Things that might be very important in sentencing. Here, we might very well be able to get some value added, but the studies are not there yet for the most part. There aren't enough of them. Uh, Kent, for instance, is doing the first ever prospective study of using neuroscience to predict future dangerousness. We're all very excited to see how much value added there's going to be, how much marginal extra accuracy will be produced compared to using, uh, let's say, behavioral techniques, which have been around for a long time. All right. I said I'd give you an example of where the neuroscience could help us. What I'm looking for is a reflective scientific conceptual uh, equilibrium where we take our folk psychological concepts, we take our neuroscience, and we use each to refine the other. And what I'm hoping is, so the law talks about purpose, knowledge, recklessness, and negligence as mental states. What I'm hoping is the neuroscience and the philosophy of mind and action together can refine those concepts. Let's go to Mr. Oft. I won't talk about the disappearing person, the radical view. There's no, there isn't remotely science yet to suggest we're just victims of neuronal circumstances, the massive reductivist approach. Okay, so Hank basically gave you the setup. Here's a guy, he's got the tumor, he's becoming increasingly pedophilic, he finally touches his daughter. A couple of more things. He kept all this secret while he was doing it. Absolutely. He didn't do it with people watching and stuff like that. At the end, as we know, at the end, he was incontinent. He was failing a program. He had every reason to want to pass, the one that would keep him out of prison. He started to have you know, real gait problems. He had a problem with his handwriting. Interestingly enough, his moral sense was intact. He was completely oriented and the like. So what do we think about this guy at the time of the crime? Notice we have two distinct questions, given what we know. One question is, is he less culpable? Second question, how should we respond in terms of sentencing or treatment? Those are separable questions. They are, of course, related, but they are at least analytically distinguishable. So what we're not concerned with is the time when he finally had the operation, when the tumor was resected the first time. Here was a guy who clearly was deteriorating badly. And by the end, when he was urinating on himself, claiming he was going to rape the landlady, uh, molesting the women in the emergency room and the like, clearly one could draw the inference this is a guy who had rational capacity vastly diminished. But at the time he touched his stepdaughter, and that was the crime, got one minute, I'm going to be done in one minute. At the, time he, at the time he touched his stepdaughter, the tumor was not as far advanced, and the behavioral signs and symptoms of diminished rationality and diminished self-control were many fewer.
Now, was it his fault he was a pedophile? Of course not. Is it anybody's fault that they have pedophilic desires? Of course not. Here we know the story. But there's always a story. We're in a causal universe. We all know that. So here I know it's the tumor. Somebody else, it was his parents and his environment and whatever. There's always a story, but he acted on it. I'm sorry for him that he had it, but he acted on it. Was his rationality, was his control capacity sufficiently diminished? We'd want to mitigate him or excuse him. That's the question. And from the very short neurological report we have in the Archives of Neurology, we don't have enough data on that. But that's the question. And I can deal with this case as well as I can deal with the ordinary case. Thank you.